then then I'm going to say a lot. And I think the others in this chat, we probably have a lot of small people, smart people in here, so they will still talk a lot. And then I hope you get something out of that. Um, is it Anna? Yes, hi all. Hi. Uh, uh, well, I'm from Novosibirsk, and I've been debating in Russian uh, for a long time, about five years. But uh, as for debating in, in English, it's my first experience. <laughs> so excuse my English. <laughs> it's great, no problem. It's all good. Thank you. Uh, Andre? Uh, which one? Uh, which one? Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I don't think that I'm going to manage to uh, read out your last name. So let's start with Andre with the fancy background. What, what's your last name? Uh, Smirnov. Smirnov. Cool. If you could start. Yeah, I'm debating for three years, uh, making videos for Russian community, debate montage, and playing an English debate for three or four months. Also played on London Cup two or three weeks ago. It was hard to play. Andre is actually a person going to a lot of Russian competitions and recording finals and so on, and uh, actually all the rounds. So we have over a thousand videos in our group uh, on another social network. Amazing. Okay, cool. So you've seen a lot of debates. Is there anything specific that you hope to learn during this workshop? Yeah, in in this uh, workshop, I finished my knowledge about things that I already know. Because some things you should repeat one, two, three, five, ten times, and repeat as yourself. And only uh, after you repeat as yourself, you will remember this fully. Many people just watch. Uh, videos or training go to home and forget everything. The moment when you repeat as themselves, it's very important. In yeah. English debate. In so repeat and practice too. And yeah. just make sure it becomes part of your muscle memory and you will never be able to forget it. Yeah. In English yeah. debates, it's very strange for me because only in English debate you have 10, 50 seconds just to take a question. In our debates, no one does this. No one says, I stop my speech, I'm going to uh, take a question from you. We, because how does it work in your format? Uh, we, we or just don't take a question, or even if we take a question, we do this not so often. Because even when I was a really low tier room, everyone was taking a question, a question, a question. Yeah, that's part of the format, yeah, and everyone is encouraged to accept at least one question per speech, so that might be different from the format you're, uh, you're used to. No, right? it's the same format, actually. We oh, are we are trying to push on more people to accept questions. Pushing on more POIs, okay, uh, that's lesson number one from this workshop, accept the POI, A, because it makes judges happy, B, if you're smart and you give a smart answer, the other team's like, I, problematic, but also C, most important reason to accept it, it often foreshadows what their rebuttal or their own argument is going to be. So actually they're handing you some free information that you can then act upon, while otherwise they would all still have said it in their speech and you wouldn't have a time to respond. So just take them because it will only make your own speech stronger. Um, so far for the commercial part of asking POIs also in Russian, let's go to Aslan. I'm Arsalan, I've debated for two years, I'm from Azerbaijan, and I hope to learn a lot more. Cool, thank you. And then we go to uh, Andrei Kazianenko. Uh, yes, hello, my, you can call me Andrew if it's uh, most suitable f for you. And uh, I have been debating for over three years already, uh, so, and when I uh, had uh, the debating experience of two years. Uh, it was uh, in uh, 2019, uh, and I had some success uh, in my country, so I uh, had uh, won some titles. I decided to uh, start uh, international debating career, and actually I uh, 
began to learn English exactly for debating. So I didn't know uh, English at all uh, two years ago. Uh, so, uh, and uh, despite uh, uh, some attempts, so I had uh, 15, 15 uh, speak, uh, two points at uh, Euros, I almost broke it. And uh, oh, there are some cases when uh, I have uh, high speaker points, but uh, despite that, I uh, don't have any success in uh, on international arena yet. And uh, in order to get it, I uh, always visit some uh, workshops, uh, watch it, and I uh, appreciate uh, such an experience. So thank you very much. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing your experience. And then we have one, uh, Andre Left, if I'm correct. Yes, yeah, so it's me. Uh, I've been debating for about uh, three years, and uh, I've come to this uh, session to get some more practical skills because in our community, or maybe it's just my uh, perspective, maybe I uh, focus more on the theoretical side, and it's not. Sometimes it is it is useful, but sometimes uh, it lacks practice. So I'd like to practice these uh, like skills more in here. Cool, very good. Thank you very much. Did I forget anyone? Mm, yes, me. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Jailan, and as for my experience, I started debating basically since uh, quarantine started. I started debating as well uh, because it was just a survival mechanism, really. Um, then uh, we debated during quarantine online. Then me and my friend Elizabeth Crew, we decided to start a debating club uh, in St. Petersburg, because that is where we live. Uh, we started doing ho hosting debates in libraries and in schools, simply because we felt like this is a culture that is not very popular in Russia. And like in our countries, I come from Egypt and she comes from Britain, and that was quite different. So we are trying to spread this uh, culture here. And um, the main reason we came here is because we are trying to teach people how to debate not only for tournaments or like professionally but just uh even for personal sake simply improving whether it be your speaking skills persuasive skills uh critical thinking and so on and so forth and even philosophical thinking is uh, with uh, philosophical mo uh, emotions and uh, i feel like we need more of the academic part is like how to teach people how to do this because it's it's like more of like you learn by experience so how to put it into words and that's mainly why i'm here cool very good Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It sounds like a great initiative. Um, I saw some people dropped out, rejoined. So I think I'm just going to continue right now. And then uh, if, if, if you still want to, to, to share anything, let me know. Um, because what I think you might like is that um, um, since I'm seeing Emma in my screen as well, I'm going to talk about you too, Emma, sorry. But um, since we are both not native speakers, we felt that when we went to tournaments, um, we really needed to understand all the concepts of a debate. So we really needed a deep understanding of what argumentation was because we are not as fluent and as efficient as the people that we went up against. So that meant that if we would say the exact same thing but needed more words to say that, we would be able to do less in the speech. Meaning that we needed to be very critical towards what we said, what we didn't say, and like really fully understand all the concepts like argumentation, rebuttal, way offs, whatever. Uh, and the effect of that is that for us to be able to improve, we really needed to make some like models or guidelines for ourselves that we could follow to improve those skills. And the good thing about that is that it also makes it easier to teach other people because it's not uh, only intuition, but you have to come up with some kind of models and models are easily transferable. So what I will do, to do with you today is share some of those models. And the idea is not that you uh, copy them because you can if they work, but it's more to give you more insight in what an argument is, what a good argument is, what it consists of, what common mistakes are, same for rebuttal. And then it's up to you whether you try decide to copy paste that exact exact same model or use the insights you have to create your own way of making arguments. That's all up to you. But that's the the goal for today. And I also would like you to practice with some of those models. And if you have questions during any time this training, just uh, raise your hand, unmute yourself, and uh, let me know. 
And then I think it's time to uh, start the workshop. I will, um, will I start sharing my screen? Uh, no, I want to start with a question. So most of you have some or quite some debate experience already. And uh, I think everyone has an understanding of what an argument is just in abstract. But I'm very curious how you would normally make arguments. So do you have a set way of doing it or, or not? So is there anyone in here who has a um, structure that they normally use to develop an argument? Yeah. Yes, I hear some yeses. Let's start with uh, Kato. Uh, yeah, so normally um, what I would be doing, uh, I'm unfortunately not uh, debating anymore. I'm mostly judging or being a trainer. But when, what I was doing before that was uh, brainstorm with my team members. That is the most, um, one of the crucial parts of uh, setting an argument and um, just uh, trying to figure out what topics to talk about for uh, the case. OK, good. Thank you. Uh, Gilan? Yeah, so usually we have this rule of uh, RI, assertion, then we give a reason, and then we give an example, and then we give an impact. Um, that is the structure we use to build an argument. Okay, thank you. What I'm going to, use you to ask you to do is uh, all of you should be able to click on this link and then access like a huge sort of blank paper. And um, I'm going to ask, uh, Jilan, is it Jilan or Jilan? Yeah, Jailan. <laughs> Jailan, okay. Uh, yeah. Whether you can maybe, uh, if, if it works out, and you can actually open the, 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 the tab that I sent you, if you could write down the model that you use for making arguments, and then I can ask others to do the same, so we have sort of an oversight of all the, uh, the different models that are used. For the people who cannot open the link, I'll open it for you, so you should be able to see my screen right now. Um, the only thing is that I can no longer see you. So, Emma, if people raise their hand, could you give a turn for me? Yes. I assume that's it. cool. Uh, so, is there anyone who wants to to share the model that they're using? Uh, sorry. Uh, when I uh, click on this link, I will have to join with the email that we're using right now, or. Oh, you, you shouldn't have to fill in anything. Just your name should be enough. Isn't that um, working? But here says the work email to join. Yeah, he asked. Yep, yeah, same, same. Same for you? OK, then um, I'll give you a different link that should work. Then let's try this one. There is a built-in meet feature that we can try to use. I can set yeah, it up. Yeah, but I see that this is working now. I see okay. people coming. OK. Thank you. Yep, yep, it's working. Cool. Uh, so thank you, uh, Jailan. If you could, uh, what you can do is you can double click, and then you get a post-it, and you can write whatever you want. And then, uh, so if, if you could write your model with assertion and um, the, the example and the stuff you said. And then oh, other 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 people who use a standard model. Andre, Andrew, Andre has his hand raised, right? Am I misreading the Russian letters? Might be possible. I'm I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask, how should I write it in there? The link is not working. The link isn't working at all for you. No. Like, no. no, it did open and it asked me to sign in and then it took me totally out of the call. Okay, then I'll write it for you. Can you repeat the, uh, the, the model you used one more time? Yeah, sure. Assertion? Yes. Then, reason? Reason? Yes. Evidence? Yes, an impact. impact. Yep. So could you explain to the others what you um, do in all those separate parts? So what do you do in the assertion part? 
So basically, assertion is a claim. So it could be anything. For example, uh, smoking is bad for your health. It's just a sentence that needs a reason. Why do you think that smoking is bad for your health? So for example, yep. you can say, uh, the reason now is uh, it has been proven that it shortens um, a human's lifespan, for example. Then you can give, uh, 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 sorry, no, because it has this reason could be that it has nicotine, for example, that is cancerous. Then the evidence could be that it has been proven that uh, it decreases the human lifespan. And then impact is according to the motion. So basically an impact uh, tells me why is it important for me in this specific debate about this specific motion to know that smoking is bad for your health. So if the motion is, for example, this house will ban smoking, you can say your impact will be like, Okay, it's killing people, and that's why I need to save people. So we are trying to save human lives. So that is my impact. Good, clear. Okay, uh, that I understand. I think there are very uh, there, there are quite some very important elements in there. Um, so that that's very good. What I will do is people can can finish just writing down their um, uh, the, the the way they make arguments, and then I will start with a short presentation about some generic aspects that should always be in an argument and then I'll go back to the sheet and see which words or form formats or whatever you use to uh, describe them. So one of the, uh, we're going to start here. I think the key to every argument that you're going to make is that it should at least have two parts. A, why is your argument true? B, why is your argument important? So in the argument that we just heard, the argument was uh, that, that smoking is bad for you and it might kill you. And then question number one is, why is it true that smoking might lead to you dying sooner? And question number two is, why is it important that, uh, and let's say this, the motion is this, how to ban smoking. And then first, why is it true that smoking is bad? B, why is it so bad that it should thus be banned? So those two aspects should always be in an argument. Now, that is, this is true for every format, whether you, but also true for writing a thesis or whatever. The most important thing for you is because the, the, the experience with BP was, was a bit, uh, was sort of uh, different within the group, is as you know, BP is a format with four teams. So what judges often do is they, they go over a team and then the first question they ask themselves is, to what extent do I believe that your argument is true? And then they're going to compare that in terms of relevancy to the other arguments in the round. So what you need to keep in mind when we talk about analysis and argumentation is that an argument is almost never true or not true, but it's true to a certain extent. So if I say, um, smoking uh, will, will, will make sure you uh, live a shorter life, then it's not true that everyone who smokes dies earlier than they would have done if they would not have been smoking. Because we all know that one example of a grandpa who became 120 even though he was smoking. But the point is, to what extent is the argument true that smoking is bad for you? And then what your analysis does, it, it proves the likelihood of that claim being true. So it proves that in the majority of cases, it's very likely that you die sooner when you smoke. That's one part. And the second part is then the relevancy of that claim that you're making. That's just sort of basic, basic uh, terms of what an argument is. So what we're going to do today is we're going to zoom in on how can I, step number one, prove that my argument is true. So what do I need to do to make it as likely as possible that oh that was my iphone to show that is as likely as possible that the argument is true and that is in the end what analysis is i saw uh yes and artem uh, was this about one of the things in the mural or was uh, this to me the message that i sent yes Oh, that was, uh, um, well, Gillian uh, was describing, uh, uh, I think it was very similar to Saxe, basically different names. Yes. And this is a very popular format in Russian. In Russian. 
Cool. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Yeah. So that, that that's one of the models that is often uh, been used. And what I want to start with in a bit is um, I want to make the term analysis a bit more specific and a bit more concrete. Because what often happens is that people are being told you were lacking some analysis, you should have analyzed more, uh, your analysis wasn't thorough enough, the, the, the other teams were more detailed or more specific in their analysis. But if that term doesn't really resonate, it's kind of vague what it, what it, what it means to be uh, specific enough and when are you specific enough and when are you not specific enough. So the first thing that I want to do is that together we will uh, visualize what analysis means and we're going to work from there. So the first thing that we're now going to do is visualizing what analysis is and you can both use this to prove why your claim is true and why your claim is relevant because in both cases you need to analyze how that works in the end. Um, so it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the, um, the, the, the reason step from uh, Jylan's model or with Andrew who said, uh, also you said reasons within sexy, it would be the, the explain step. It doesn't matter how you call it, but in every argumentative model, there's a step that requires you to explain why your argument is true and why it's relevant. And to answer those questions, you need analysis. So I'm going to show you what analysis is. And for that, I will share my screen again. So if we take a uh, very, very basic motion, this, so uh, Let's say we just take the motion, this house would ban alcohol and we're opposition. And the argument that we're going to make is that banning alcohol will lead to uh, a black market. Very straightforward argument. What we need to do, as we mentioned before, we need to explain why it's true and we need to explain why it's relevant. Um, so, does anyone have an idea why I wrote down banning alcohol on the top, black market on the bottom, and then left a lot of white space in between? Does anyone have a, did anyone give me a suggestion why I did that? Well, motion, it's like a point A, uh, and uh, black market, it's the point B, and we have to show the logic chain uh, exactly. how we lead, how the motion leads to such a result. Exactly, that's exactly what I want you to do. So there's a lot of white space in here and the analysis on why it's true that banning alcohol leads to a black market is what we will write in between. So can someone explain to me why banning alcohol will lead to a black market? I can say. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. If you ban alcohol, you didn't ban a feeling how people want to drink alcohol people still want to drink. If you don't work with this mo moment, you can't uh, win battle against alcohol. Okay, so the thing is, I could have written that point everywhere on this line. So I could also have put it there, but I side, decide to put it at the top because I think it's a plausible claim that some people will still want to drink alcohol. But why that means that we will automatically have a black market is unclear to me. Because if this was all the analysis that I would get and I would be in opposition and I would said, okay, maybe it's true that people still want to drink alcohol. However, A, there will not be any stores uh, selling the alcohol. B, even if you want to buy it, you're more afraid of being caught than your, uh, the, the, than your urge is, is to buy that alcohol. So even if you have the feeling that you want it, you will not do it in the end. That means that there's still a lot of analysis left between people want to drink it and a black market is created. So can anyone else explain to me why the fact that people will drink it, still want to drink it, will lead to the fact that the black market will be created? 
So analysis. Okay, I can try. Yes, go ahead. Uh, well, the fact that some people uh, still want to drink alcohol means that they are ready to pay uh, for the alcohol. And it means that other people uh, still want to make profit out of this. Uh, let's assume that this is the same people who now are already ready to go illegal, for example, to sell, um, um, to sell drugs and so on. Uh, and the, the fact that this is illegal, uh, don't, mm, uh, they are not afraid of this and they are ready to make profit out of that. So uh, these uh, producers, these sellers, uh, will form this black market for the people who are ready to pay, to overpay, to get their, uh, what, what they want. Uh, and this, so uh, that's how the black market uh, is forming in this, uh, in our motion. Okay. So then this would be the argument. So we would ban alcohol, but people still want to drink. That means that they're willing to pay. Given that they are willing to pay, there will be people who want that money, namely people who are already willing to break the law and already commit crimes, sell drugs, whatever. They will now just add alcohol to the things they sell. That means that we get a black market. And why is a black market so bad? Because we can, uh, we can't control it as a government. We can't control uh, the pricing or forming of the price. Uh, it can be overpriced, and people will lose their money. And we can't control quality, uh, so that there will be very, very high risk of uh, of bad alcohol uh, that will uh, influence influence people so that they will lose uh, their health and uh, and their lives even. Cool, okay. So we have no control, it means that the alcohol is very dangerous, it might lead to people poisoning themselves. That story. Um, so I think in essence, this is the basics of how you make an argument. And um, that means that we already see sort of three steps being created in this process that you always need to keep in mind. So step one, when you make an argument, is have a clear thesis, thesis slash statement. This would be step one. Um, who can explain what I mean when I say have a clear thesis or statement? Uh, I think in this case, um, black market, is the thesis and the statement uh, that this will be created and that it will be bad. Yeah, almost, almost there. I think the black market is an important part, but for me, the thesis would be, um, I will enlarge this in a bit. So the thesis would be, again, Yes. The thesis would be why banning alcohol will lead to a black market. Because what we now did was pretty easy because I asked you to fill in the blanks. But one of the problems that we often see when we judge a debate is that people don't exactly know what it is that they need to explain. So what then often happens is that they are explaining a lot of stuff that doesn't lead to their impact. So the way you formulate a thesis is as follows, what you do, let's make that one uh, purplish. Could anyone come up with some sort of a formula on how you formulate a thesis? How people will know about black market? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's specifically for this argument, but I'm, I, I mean, can you come up with sort of a general formula that would be applicable to the uh, at least the practical arguments of all motions on how to formulate a thesis. So uh -huh. it should contain the consequence you're going to prove and uh, should it should be as concise as it's uh, possible because yes. uh, some people are used to do so large uh, thesis uh, and it becomes so difficult sentences and it's uh, difficult to proceed. 
I agree. So you have one important part now, and you said it should include the, the, the consequence or the outcome of the argument. That's one. But it should include a second part. And if you have an idea, just unmute yourself and say the second part. So the motion leads to consequence. Yes. So oh, this is like a very basic. It's the change provided by the motion. So the change provided by this motion is status quo, alcohol is legal. The change is alcohol will be banned. So banning alcohol will lead to the impact, namely a black market being created. Uh, if we say this house would um, uh, legalize all drugs, then status quo, drugs are not legal. Change provided by the motion, drugs are legalized impact safer drug use so the thesis would be in this argument i will show why legalizing the um uh sale of drugs will lead to safer drug use for example um so let's do a very very quick practice round um the motion is this house would allow people to sell their organs People would allow uh, this house would allow the sale of organs, and uh, could you all, could you all take uh, like twenty seconds to come up with a thesis in favor of the motion? So you think think of an argument in favor of the motion. This house would allow the sale of human organs, and then come up with a thesis. So this house would allow the sale of human organs. So argument in favor of the motion, this house would allow the sale of human organs, then come up with a thesis. So uh, Igor, did you manage to come up with a thesis? Uh, no, I would like to just think a bit. Think a bit, okay, that's fine. Uh, Masha, maybe? Mm, yeah, I also need just a couple more minutes. Couple more minutes. Anyone else? Mm, yeah, I can try. Yeah, go ahead. So making sale of organs legal leads to uh, making organs for whom, uh, for people who need them uh, more available and affordable. Uh, yes, so making, making the sale of human organs legal will lead to uh more uh, available organs for those who need it that's fine that's a very clear thesis and then the analysis would pr would be proving why legalizing the sale leads to that outcome of more people uh getting that organ if they need one exactly that's it so what we will do is i will give you a bit of extra explanation and then I will give you a motion and ask you to write an argument in favor of the motion and then we can practice all of this, all of what we're doing right now. Uh, but first I want to give you a bit extra info because um, step one is the thesis, step two is why is the argument true and step three is why is the argument relevant so then that's like the basic structure of an argument my question to you guys would be 
we now gave some analysis on why banning alcohol would lead to a black market. And that those are like all the yellow, yellow steps that we did in here. Now my question to you is, um, almost all the models that I saw that you provided also talked about examples, evidence, uh, illustrations, those kind of things. What's the role of evidence and illustrations and examples within an argument? Why do we why do we give those? A way of simplification to make it uh, easier for the judge and the people to visualize the impact. Exactly, and by doing so, so by making it very very tangible, very concrete, you make your claims more plausible. So what examples actually do is they show that all the steps that you've been giving here are not just steps that you came up with uh, in your mind and something that we came up with in a dark room in a university somewhere where the sun was shining outside, which we never saw, but that it's actually something that's happening within the real world too. So it's making that step. What I want to say to you, all of you is that examples should never be a replacement of that analysis of those lines of logic that we are providing so what you always do is you use the, those examples and those illustrations to add something to that line of logic so what we're now going to do is i'm going to add a bit more of an advanced step to this but if you're completely new to debating uh, or relatively new and you don't understand this part that I'm going to explain right now, that's not a problem, because then you can just use the model over here for the argument that we're gonna make in a bit. So then you can just start with the statement, explain why the statement is true, and explain why the statement is relevant. So for the people who are just starting out, just use those three steps that will be enough to come up with a clear argument. For the people who are debating a longer time and, and are saying to us, we, we sort of know how the game works, we're doing pretty well, but we want to do better at international tournaments. I'm going to uh, add one thing through the argumentation model that will uh, really make a difference, or at least for me really made a, a, a difference when I started doing that. Um, so so uh, if you get it, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Stick to the first, first part. The second part is that we are now pretending as if a practical argument is just a straight line of steps that are all equally valuable and that will lead from the beginning to an end point. But in real life, that's not really true because some of those steps are going to be contested more than other steps are going to be. So for example, the fact that um, having a black market that a lot of people attend is bad is probably not going to be contested as much as the fact that people's will to drink alcohol means that they are willing to go out to the black market to some kind of uh, sketchy dealer they don't know and actually start buying alcohol that had no like no, that they have no control over because that step is probably going to be contested way more so what I want to do for the um, slightly more experienced people is provide you with sort of an alternative. And the alternative will be as follows. We still start with our statement um, and we still have an impact. But what we do is you start with finding the different assumptions in the argument. And before you start analyzing the, the little steps, you just come up with the big steps in the argument that people need to uh, that that needs to be proven. And I'm going to give a quick example here. Here, um,
Because I think that the two biggest uh, assumptions or the two biggest blocks in this argument are that people will still be uh, will, that people still want you to buy alcohol even though it's illegal and that there are people who will still be willing to sell alcohol even though it's illegal. I think those are the two biggest sort of assumptions in this argument. And what you could do then is make sure that you come up with different reasons that all support that one uh, that one claim. So what you could do, and again, this is a more advanced thing, is first coming up with the different assumptions in an argument, and then come up with multiple reasons why that specific claim is true. So I'm going to um, ask one of, uh, now I'm gonna ask it to all of you. Could you come up with multiple reasons why, regardless of the fact that alcohol is illegal, people are still uh, willing to, uh, to, to go on to the black market and pay for it. Could you try to come up with some reasons for that? If you have an idea. Addiction. Have... Sorry? Addiction. Addiction. I think that's one. Yes. Another reason. Uh, alcohol is a huge part of like many traditions and lifestyles of many people. And also it's like, it's now forbidden and that means people want it more and there's also part of you know denial that the government um denies people something and they more wanted more for it okay cool in fact that you know our limit our choices are limited right now by the government okay so the, then we have three separate reasons why people would still be one thing that alcohol um and then could you also come up with multiple reasons why people still will sell the alcohol? Uh, yes. Well, firstly, I think people don't believe that they will be caught by police. So they don't believe in possibility of that. Uh, and secondly, even they will have some problems. I think uh, they rely on corruption and think that it can save them. Okay. Um yeah I, I think I dish, additionally uh, the most important part is uh, they will gain maybe more profit even before when alcohol was legal and they were selling it because uh, as we know in the black market prices m m are mostly set higher than on the market price so the additional profit they gain is uh, the incentive for them to still sell the alcohol cool so uh, are you okay with me summarizing that as you can earn a lot of money, so even if you're caught, that will be worth it? Yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. So what you then get is an argument that's way more layered than this one chain of analysis. So here the argumentation was people still want to drink alcohol, therefore they're willing to pay others will be willing to uh, produce alcohol that creates a black market. Black market is bad because no control. If you go to a more advanced level, then you say, okay, this house will ban alcohol. We think it leads to a black market. There are two important questions that we need to examine. Question number one, why are people likely to still buy alcohol when it's illegal? Three reasons. Reason number one, we have a group of people that is addicted. So regardless of whether it's legal or not, they will buy the alcohol. B, it's a huge part of uh, social life in general. That means that people don't really see the harm of alcohol. They have been drinking it for a, lot of, a long time without any problems. So they, they think that the government is clearly over-exaggerating and therefore they will start buying that alcohol uh, because they really don't think it's a danger. See, there's a different group of people who would actually want the alcohol more if it's forbidden because blah, blah, blah. And then the second key question is why will people then still sell the alcohol? Is And then you answer those three questions. Piece of advice that I want to give you when you formulate those different assumptions, so the, 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 the key points of the argument, make sure that they are very specific to the motion. So what I did is not something that I would advise you to do, because now I say people will still want alcohol, people will still sell alcohol. But a better assumption would be, why will people still want alcohol even though it's illegal? 
because within all those steps, you want to explain why it's such a big part of social life that even though it's illegal, they will still buy it. Why, for this one, it might be clear, why they are so addicted that even though it's harder to get it, they will still go the extra mile to get the alcohol. So that was that's what the sort of real assumption uh, would be in the argument. And then when when you're explaining those those things, you explain them in the same way as you did here, namely with the with the little steps. Okay, so before we go into practice, because what we're going to do now is going into practice, are there um, any questions about either the first way of making an argument, which would just be come up with a clear thesis, give steps on why it's true, and give steps on why it's relevant, or the second way where you say, I come up with a thesis, then I split it up into different assumptions, and then I give multiple reasons per assumptions. Is there anything unclear about that, or do you have any questions before you can start practicing? You're all very quiet, so I guess that's a uh, no. If you have I'm questions. sorry. Yeah? yeah, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, you said multiple assertions and then multiple reasons. Like I understand the multiple reasons, but what are the multiple assertions? So uh, you mean like people will still want alcohol and that people will still sell alcohol. Those are assertions. Yes. Okay, so you're nope. using more than one assertion plus more than one reason to prove one impact. Um, no, I would, to be precise, I would say I would use more than one assumption or assertion in, a, in an argument, and I would uh -huh. use more than one reason to prove each assumption or each assertion. Uh -huh. So not just okay. to prove the impact, but, but in my head it would be like the, the lowest step, most micro step, is reasons proving assertions or assumptions, and the assumptions slash assertions that are proved prove the argument, prove the thesis. Oh, okay. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, then I will give you uh, some uh, motions, and then you can develop arguments. And um, since the group is fairly small, I think you can just develop the arguments individually, and then we can uh, discuss them. So what I will do is I'll send you a list of motions, then you can uh, pick the motion you prefer, and then you can write an argument either in favor or against the motion. That's, uh, that's completely up to you. So here are some uh, motions. I'll post the motions in the chat. And let's say we take um, 10 minutes to write one argument. You can pick the motion you prefer, can choose why you're, whether, whether you're prop or op, and then choose one of the methods. So either more of a straightforward one, and I would advise everyone who's just starting out to do that, to just do it a bit more straightforward. And people who feel like they want an extra challenge and really want to train for international tournaments, I would advise you to do the other one. So the uh, here, the what you would do is uh, with a thesis, key assumptions. So you either use this one, come up with a thesis, identify key assumptions, give multiple reasons on why the assumptions are true and why the argument is important, or you use this one, which is a bit more straightforward. I will delete this and then post them next to each other so it's easier for you guys to uh, keep track. And can you please send once again the link 
uh, to this, I don't know, page or something, because when I went out, it disappeared from the chat. Yes, of course. So here you have the link again uh, and the motion. Um, so let's say that we uh, start discussing the arguments 10 past 4. Are there any questions before, before you can start developing the arguments? I think that's all. Uh, are we supposed to develop it uh, in accordance with this uh, website, or should we do it uh, orally in our sheets of paper? Whatever you prefer. You can do both. Oh, okay. I think there's enough space here to do it here, but you can also just do it with pen and paper. You can do it in a Google Doc, just whatever, whatever you prefer. OK, good. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, yeah, we are going to start again. So uh, what I would like you to do, um, if you, I, I, I would like to ask some people to share their arguments so that we can give some uh, feedback on that collectively. So if you push the raise hand button, if you would be willing to share your argument, that's great because then I have, don't have to force people who don't want to. Uh, yes, I see a lot of people. Good, good, good. Um, Anna, would you like to start? Okay, I can start. Uh, so the notion, this house would legalize the selling of organs. And uh, my thesis for uh, opposition is that allowing people to sell their organs will push poor people uh, to sell their organs uh, irrationally uh, and harm their bodies. Why is it true? Poor people can see no alternative to earn enough money to make their living to uh, live uh, the way they want to live, uh, seeing these um, bright advertisements and uh, the, um, uh, how to say it, uh, for example, uh, lots of, uh, like American dream narratives and so on, uh, so, uh, uh, narrative of capitalism and so on. Uh, they will choose this way uh, as most attractive uh, and three reasons of that. They are not, uh, pretty often they are not educated enough to understand how living without uh, an organ influences uh, themselves and influences the, their bodies. Second, they will see uh, lots of bright advertisement posted by corporations and clinics uh, seeking for, uh, for more organs and for more money uh, that will say them that it is uh, not, it is safety, uh, th this is a safe way and they will, uh, I'm sorry um, for, for this noise, okay. uh, uh, so this uh, what will make their life better. Uh, sec uh, third reason, they do not have um, other, uh, um, other opportunities and other capital to make profit. They can uh, only compete for low qualified jobs, low uh, paid jobs. They can't invest money because they don't have money and they can not secure a bank loan to gain uh, some money. Moreover, they do not want to right, right now in the status quo, they do not want to harm other people uh, by committing a crime, for example, but they already harm themselves by overworking and making physically hard and harm, harmful labor. And it seems for them uh, like the equal harm uh, of uh, making the, uh, this harmful labor and selling organs. Why does it matter? The, these people, poor people, uh, can get uh, can get ill. They can get diseases. They can even even get death due to uh, this because they are not uh, aware of all the risks uh, they they are possessed, and they are the most uh, I don't know how to say it the most undefeated <laughs> undefeated uh, people who have even no money uh, to make their, their living in status quo. And we, as a, uh, the, the government, have a special duty to this weakest person, or to, to, for these weakest people who uh, can't uh, right now, or who will uh, chase this uh, easy money irrationally. 
So we, oh, we are happy to oppose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will also give some feedback right away. Um, I think what you did very well was like the, the leveled layers on why they are likely to be forced into this decision without um, thinking about it completely rationally. And I think in, uh, you had all the basic elements of the argument, so I really like that. Uh, some thoughts. First one is, 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 is sort of structure and conciseness. You had a bit of sort of a, a piece of analysis before you went into your three reasons at the beginning, directly after the thesis. And I think that part wasn't really necessary be all, because all of that basically already came back in your three reasons too. Just So just to save some time, I think you could have skipped that part. Um, what I think is most importantly, is most important is um, you did very well sort of skill-wise in developing the ideas, but be very critical towards yourself when you choose the ideas because you should always make sure that an argument is sort of inherent and very, very closely linked to the motion and that part of your argument could not be tackled by a simple model on the proposition side. So, for example, I think that your idea about people are not educated and about it being very dangerous, which are two key elements of the argument, could be fairly simply taken out if a prime minister would say, of course, when you sell your organs, you will it will be mandatory to have a conversation with a doctor for at least three times before you say yes, so that you know what the consequences are, and the procedure will happen in a hospital, so there's a lot of oversight, and we will make sure that it's safe. If you have a model like that, then this argument becomes slightly vulnerable because it's either unclear why they cannot process that information and the exact harm might be slightly unclear. And that's my last point of feedback. Um, if you bring this argument, then, uh, sorry, give me one second. Um, the, the, the second thing is your, your key impact is they might make a lot of money, but it's not worth it because it's so dangerous. Then those dangers need to be uh, explained very well because otherwise it's unclear why those dangers do not weigh up against the money they earn, especially because you explain that they have no other options, etc. Uh, so well done. I think this is be the feedback that I would give to you. Well, well done. This is structure-wise exactly what I'm uh, what I'm looking for. So thanks. Well done. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Cool. Uh, then we go to. Um, I see a hand, uh, Andre, and then your name start. Oh, your last, I cannot read your last name. I'm so sorry. Uh, so the the other the other Andre, <laughs> with the with the camera as a photo. Or is it not you? Oh no, sorry, you didn't raise your hand. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I'm going to do it later. Yeah. No, but I saw Lisa's hand. That's the hand I was referring to. So Lisa, could you do yours? Okay. Um, it's the notion about cu uh, cutting the aid to non-democratic states. Um, so I am as a um, So the first thing is that uh, it enforces those states to keep doing immoral acts towards their uh, inhabitants of the countries. Firstly, because um, there are directly more resources for them to uh, to uh, kind of show their power, right, and act, the more resources, more money. Secondly, uh, all this money that comes, they're being distributed among the government officials, not democratic, corrupted, corrupt government officials that will uh, cling to their places, want to sustain, like keep these places even more for that. They will not move at any cost, that, you know, in any under any circumstances. Mm, uh, and also, uh, it, the other argument is that it undermines the democracy in the state that grants the aid to those non-democratic states. Firstly, because it shows the support, uh, it shows support to non-democratic governments, which is hypocritical. Mm, really, once they promote democracy in their own country and they seem to support it as, you know, a method of governing a state, but then again, they support uh, non-democratic states, which is extremely hypocritical. And people might uh, question 
the inhabitants of the country, they might question, start questioning their own government and its real motives. Does it really, is it really the government that they need? And it might cause social disrupt. And the last argument is that people in the state itself, in the non-democratic state we're talking about, uh, the people, they may not... Um, recognize the problems with their own country um, just because they are not personally affected by the non-democratic kind of power with this. Uh, firstly, be, uh, g because the funds, they may create an illusion of improvement of the economic state of the country and maybe the fact that some of the money are really go really go for, you know, like good causes. And the other thing is that people who do not yet yeah, suffer um, from non-democratic release of power, they may not feel the need to change anything. That is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm correct. You 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 ran multiple arguments, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, so first, very basic point of feedback, structure-wise, it would be good to to make your announcements a bit more explicit, so you make it as easy as possible for a judge to know what you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. now the arguments were sometimes uh, really like one big story, and it might sometimes makes it slightly hard to follow. So that's one little point. Um, I think one point of feedback that might help you is that um, whenever you, in an whenever in an argument you say this might happen or that might happen, you should always try to go from something might happen to. This is why it's highly likely that it will happen. So when you say something might happen, we still don't know probability-wise how likely it is that it's going to happen. While what the point of the question, why is your argument true, is, is to show why it's highly probable that the thing you're referring to is going to happen. So whenever you had a might in there, that might needs to be replaced by this is why it will probably or more, most certainly or with a high probability happen and then add some extra reasons. So for example, your argument about people will start questioning the, the legitimacy or the motives of their own state. One of your mechanisms was it is very hypocritical and that might mean that people will be critical towards their own state. And what I, I would like you to do then is say that's hypocritical. Here are three reasons why that will mean that they start questioning their own state. Give those reasons and then impact it, why it's so bad if people start questioning their own state. Um, so I think all your ideas are in there, but what I would do for every argument is um, try to figure out which points you would attack if you would be your own opposition, and then add extra analysis there. So could you, for me, pick one of your arguments, and then while I'm going to, to, to the speeches of the other people, just critically look at your own argument and think how you would rebut that argument and then use that rebuttal to, to, to identify where you could add extra analysis. Could okay. you do that okay. for me? Yeah? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, then we go to see a lot of hands. Uh, Kato. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so I chose um, the motion that this house would return all cultural treasures to their origin, country of origin. Um, so, first of all, the thesis uh, for my uh, argument would be um, that uh, it is essential to return uh, all cultural treasures to their country of origin uh, as uh, they will lead to... Um, uh, more educational purposes and cultural purposes, such as the culture will be restored. Uh, people in those nations of countries of origins may not even know about the existence of the treasures of their country. And it is very important that uh, you, uh, every nation knows what uh, they are from, what the nation is built on, etc. It could be uh, even as important as, uh, uh, for instance, some regions of the country. Uh, it could be, uh, we can also say parallel to um, the occupation problems that for instance, when some parts of the countries are occupied, uh, it could be exactly the same as if some treasures of those countries would be in other uh, held in other countries and not in their uh, home countries. 
So the most uh, important um, uh, things that I would like to emphasize um, assumptions would be that, uh, as I already mentioned, the country's culture will be restored. It will also be good for educational purposes, as for instance, uh, many schools uh, bring uh, the um, kids to the museums where they can see their nation's treasures. And uh, when these treasures could be, if in case these treasures will be returned to their um, home countries, uh, children and the young generation will know more about their nation. Um, it is also important to, to emphasize, secondly, that uh, these treasures um, could not be um, appreciated uh, at uh, the same level in other countries as in the country of the origin, and that these treasures could have very um, specific meanings, such as very traditional or religious meanings for this country, that could also be uh, very essential um, for the countries of their, their origin. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, good, clear, straightforward argument. I will delve into feedback right away just to make sure that we have as much time left as possible. Um, the first thing that I would say is make sure that your thesis is very clear because I think there are now multiple layers and not all the layers answer the same thesis. Because what you start with in your argument is returning cultural treasures is crucial for um, cultural awareness or something, something like that. I think that's one. I think there's another mechanism in there saying other countries don't care as much about it, which is not directly relevant to that one thesis. That's more sort of a way off after this argument. And then you have one that's not really about cultural awareness, but about um, how much, uh, now that's sort of about how much those individuals appreciate the fact that they have those artifacts back. I think that's a good one. Uh, my main feedback would be, one of your main lines is for educational purposes, it's crucial to have those treasures, right? Because then schools can go to museum, whatever. But what, what you haven't explained yet is what the unique role of those treasures is within shaping that cultural identity and why they need to be in your country in order to be able to do so. So a very negative opposition could now say, yeah, but we can also just Google image the images and then teachers can talk about it in the classroom. Why do you, do you need to go to a museum and physically see them in order to understand the cultural value behind it? There are a lot of us who uh, were taught about like the Roman times and have seen pictures of the Colosseum without ever going there and still we know what it was and what it looked like. So whenever you explain this, you need to make sure that the motion is not just a nice way to educate people, but that, that this is a crucial element or a very important element that could not just be replaced by something else. Because otherwise people say, but there are other ways to reach your goal without having those problems. So the, the key takeaway for your argument would be, is there a way to rebut this argument by saying, we like your goal, but we can achieve that with other methods? If so, then you need to do more analysis on why your method is so unique into reaching the goal you set out to reach. That would be my main feedback. Thanks. Yeah. Cool, then I see two more people for this part of the exercise. Uh, let's go to Jailan first. Okay, so uh, the motion I chose was this house would, uh, one second, uh, this house would cut off all development aid to non-democratic countries. So uh, my main argument is giving aid to the uh, non-democratic countries is going to help them increase the tyranny and the dictatorship. And here is my reason. First of all, my first assertion is that non-democratic countries are simply corrupt. Why? Because minority minority are ruling the majority and they have no freedom of speech so that no one could stop them. And they're simply the most superior in this country and therefore no any uh, uh, power above them and no one could stop them. And if they weren't corrupted, they wouldn't be scared of a different party coming in power. That is uh, my first assertion. My second assertion is that giving aid to the cor corrupted government would make it even more powerful. Why is that so? Because it will not, first of all, this aid wouldn't actually reach the people that uh, need it. As I said, because the government is corrupted, plus the government wouldn't want people to get any stronger and forget 
um, have any luxurious time to think about their rights. They want people to be busy with disease and hunger, to not notice the fact that they are in a dictatorship. That is number one. Number two, um, the government will use this aid to become even more powerful and maybe even buy more, uh, I don't know, like weapons and so on and so forth to be able to control and abuse the people even more and more to ensure that they stay in power for as long as as possible and the main reason for that is that they have two options they either stay on in power or get brutally punished by the uh, populations they have been abusing for years and years and therefore giving aid to non-democratic countries will definitely lead to more tyranny good good thank you what do you think my feedback is going to be you have an idea um, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. I think my main feedback would be, um, uh, I think two points. One would be on the impact of this point, uh, because I like your analysis about like uh, they're being corrupt, you strengthen the regime, all of that. But I think to really make this argument stick in a debate, you should have an, an impact where you say, okay, so in the best case for team opposition, giving that aid means that those dictators will use it for their own good and it will, will not reach the people that they set out to reach. In the worst case, you actively strengthen the regime, meaning that you actively support the malicious acts that are being taken by the regime, something like that. So that you sort of set out two different impacts. A, um, it will not harm those people more, but it will not help them, so you just throw the money away while well, it would have been well spent otherwise, or B, this money is being used to actively oppress people even more and that's something you shouldn't want. Uh -huh. so I, th I think that's one. Then a second thing that I would do, because you, you clearly have some experience with building these arguments, is, is, is critically think, are there any easy responses that could be given to this argument that I need to preempt, that I already need to think of to make my argument stronger? And I think that the easiest response here would be, okay, but why can we not just set conditions to the development aid? So if your condition would be not giving it to dictators, our condition would be we can give it to dictators, but they need to show us the money actually went to, I don't know, food, education, hospitals, whatever. Um, and, and I think that means that you need, need something in that argument on why we cannot just make sure that it goes to a good cause, even if it's, even if it's within a dictatorship. Uh -huh. I got what you mean. Uh, sorry, can you please repeat the first uh, reason? Because the first reason I already did mention uh, the idea that how, first of all, it will not reach the people, and then uh, plus it will make the dictatorship even stronger. Mm -hmm. So those are was, two different impacts, or yes. what do you mean? Yes, uh -huh. yes, and that was within uh -huh. your analysis right now, and that was good. But in your impact, I want to, to have those two reasons very clearly within one or two sentences. So I can just write uh -huh. them along, and then when I say, okay, what, what did your team say? Okay, they said either it's wasted or you actively strengthen the regime. Because otherwise, I might uh, misinterpret the point and think that you mean that not giving it makes it more likely that they will be overthrown or whatever, which requires uh -huh. way more analysis than just saying it doesn't go to where it's needed most. Uh-huh, I got you. I got you. Thank you. Okay, cool. Then we have, oh, I see one more raised hand. Okay, we do two more people and then we go on. Uh, we have the two Andres, so um, yeah, don't really care. One of you can just start uh, unmute themselves and start with the argument and then we do the other. Okay, I can start. Good. Okay, so my uh, motion is this house would cut off all development aid to non-democratic countries. And my thesis is that it would promote uh, more democracy in these countries. So uh, the first reason is that these non-democratic countries will lose resources without this uh, aid from other countries. And why is this crucial for them? First of all, because they are, uh, when they are alone, they are just too poor to, to develop themselves, like they might not have resources needed to be more uh, advanced. But even if they have resources, they might not be technologically advanced to uh, utilize these resources, which is the second reason. And the third reason is um, we don't think that these countries will turn to larger 
dictatorships like, I don't know, Russia or China, because there's a great chance that uh, these um, authoritarian leaders in these small countries or like minor countries don't want to become pawns of greater like brother who will just uh, use them in their uh, larger geopolitical uh, strategies. The second, and so they will lose resources. Second reason is that the loss of resources for these countries means that the people will get less uh, benefits and uh, they will be more poor and so on and so forth. And this will destabilize the social system in various ways. For example, different uh, social social uh, like uh, straighters will be more triggered uh, because they will have less benefits and less uh, uh, resources which they can use to like live and get along. And secondly, it will lead also to the splitting of the elites in these uh, societies. For example, if there is a clash between different like families of one monarchy or, or if there's a clash between different uh, wings of one party, they might split and uh, it will create some clash or conflict between them. And uh, they will be uh, m more likely to use this advantage, this window of opportunity. Um, thirdly, we think that dictators will be willing to give up their powers because, first of all, because uh, of the split within the elites, they're not too sure that they that their position is stable and that they can actually win over these uh, uh, people who are like protesting against them. And there is also international pressure, which means that they cannot very well use uh, uh, brute force against uh, like uh, protesters uh, and. Uh, uh, keep their regime uh, working. And uh, thirdly, even if they are cruel and want to like still be uh, within the reach of power, they understand that if they pretend to be democratic and uh, introduce some democratic mechanisms, they can very well win the first election in the country and become like not dictators, but uh, elected presidents. And this is our last point, which means that even if uh, this will be like a puppet democracy, it is still the best case as compared to uh, a dictatorship or uh, authoritarian regime because they will still have some kind of a position and they will still have to uh, offer something to people like more rights or more freedoms or more, uh, I don't know, representation for some groups or more uh, help, benefits and resources for other people. That's why democracy will help will be created and will work in this uh, case. That's all, I guess. Thank you very much. Same question to you. What do you think the, um, sorry for the noise, what do you think the uh, weakest parts of your argument are right now? Well, maybe more analysis of the counterfactual, which uh, other teams may uh, present on their side and uh, um, uh, may, maybe something connected to the structure that was not very coherent in some way. Yeah, so I, I agree with the structure. Uh, it could be slightly more coherent, but I think content-wise, one of the assumptions that, that, that's really key that needs more analysis is that it's more likely that the dictators are weakened to the extent necessary that the population actually gets more influence, then it is likely that the dictators will actually like crack down harder on their people because now they feel threatened, meaning that they're likely to m use more violence or whatever. Because I noticed you had one sentence in there or two sentences where you said the international community will sort of look at them, have some oversight so they will not escalate. But I think that then needs more explanation because if the international community would really do that, they would also like use their power to make sure that the, the, the civilians already get more power in the status quo. So why they will start like caring about the conflict uh, to the extent necessary after quitting the help, but don't do so before quitting the help is a link that sort of needs to be established to really believe that they have a way to that the civilians have a way to exercise that power that's enough to like actually like overthrow them or get more rights or whatever you get what i mean yeah i get it i see 
So, so I think the assumption should be, why do they have a, uh, a, a good chance of actually gaining more power? And then I need about four mechanisms or so, or, or three or two, they're just good mechanisms, on why it's likely that the position of the dictator is really weak enough to gain that power. Uh, yeah, so that's basically, that's basically, but I like that you use the assumptions. If you, um, if you had to redo it again, and you should and you now had to only state the assumptions that you're using in the argument, then what would the assumptions be? So I don't need the mechanisms right now, but just the key assumptions of the argument. What would you say the key assumptions are? Well, uh, my key assumptions, which I identified, were that uh, uh, these countries will lose resources, which will lead to people being more outraged, which will make them more like irritated. Uh, the second one is that uh, dictators will, yes, lose their power, or uh, how I identified it, will be uh, willing to give up their uh, dictatorship. Yeah. And uh, the third, why uh, the democracy which we are going to create will actually work in some way or like better than nothing and uh, why democracy is uh, good and so on yeah okay that's good i think you're you're almost there what i would so the first one is good so why does this mean that people will get outraged i think the second assumption is why is it likely that that outrage will lead to a better situation for the citizens and then make sure that the third one isn't like um too, too, too big of an impact. So if you want to prove that a full dictatorship goes to a full democracy and that that will go well, that's a huge impact. While if you start with smaller impacts, which would just be having enough power to be able to, I don't know, access the internet and, and make sure you, you that, that websites like Google are not blocked or making sure that um, there is less censorship in education, like really the, the, the small scale things which can have a huge impact, then it's way more likely that the judges are gonna credit you for the argument. So what I would always do in those big arguments is say, so this, at this at least means that there's more chance to get X, and then X would be, this means that there's at least a bigger chance of girls being allowed into schools, of uh, people being allowed to access the internet, and it could even lead to, and then you do your bigger impacts, because even if the bigger impacts then fall out of the debate, you still have very tangible impact standing at the end of the round. So that's uh, a tip I would give you. Okay? Yes, thanks, okay. Cool. And then we go to the last argument. Uh, uh, my case will about private school. One second. Okay, we think that we should ban private school. On private school, we understand school where for study you must pay money and it's not from government. Our mechanism will work like this. After this motion, you can't a private school can give diploma to study in university, and also they can't create the programs that means like replace or addiction of government school. We have in status quo problem that we have two types of school with great difference of quality. We understand that in private school we have much more money for one million people. And also, the, that's the most important, this money spends much better. And after much controlling and much money, we have uh, unique uh, consequences. That private school have better teachers, better programs, better personal work. All of this we don't have in usual school. This problem uh, will be, be bigger and bigger for years and years because uh, many people see how terrible quality of government school between private school and they just suffer because they must spend much and much more money uh, to study on the school because parents have to give for their children best future and uh, they understand that in future when children from government school will go versus children from private school he will lose this fight of place for study place for job. 
our main statement means that when we ban private school, we will boost quality of our education. Uh, in status quo, when you our first argument, when you want to make for your children his best future, you prefer just to send your children to private school than ask government to improve program because uh, because it's much easier. I won't give to my children good education right now. I don't want to ask government change something uh, or improve because it takes a lot of time for me. It takes a lot of time for waiting how it will change. I need uh, some people who also want to change uh, this situation with uh, not good quality in school. And I think as a parent, just better spend money uh, to send my children to private school. Uh, but most important but problem is that not all of the parents have money to send for good school. And they start to suffer because we understand that not all parents understand what is good education mean is. Many, pe many parents don't see any difference between uh, private school and usual school. And we have situation where uh, government think uh, we spend mu too much money for uh, education spend. Uh, we have a teacher, we have a children. Everyone plus plus minus are happy. But most important problem is that when they are left the school, they can't do anything versus children from private school because they had a better education, much better. And the main problem of this idea is that those, that private school. Uh, that people uh, that we create on equality in our, our in our government we think it's very important because a uh, family should spend thousand dollars just to give for their children a great and awesome future uh, and they don't see any alternative way because as i said before uh, it's very hard to uh, change the program from the government uh, because uh, you should spend many time to change everything uh, and you just don't have this this time you must wor work to bring money for home you you don't know how a good program looks like this because you don't specialize in this uh, and even if a position say that teachers have uh, in government school we have enough money or we just will just spend more money the main problem is like uh we still have all teachers and teachers that educate on a low level and we can't just replace them in one time but oh, second statement will be very long but in short we, we understand that when rich for, people for the sake, of, sake of time i'm gonna stop you here and give feedback to mm -hmm. what you did right now just because we only have 12 minutes left i uh, i hope you understand yeah uh, but, but thank you very much for doing this argument um i think the argument on why this creates inequality is clear so not everyone can access it and the level is way uh, uh higher at those schools i think that's good um i would have um two tips for you the first one is that um w w w which part of the which argument is it are this argument going to clash with do you think so which argument will clash with your argument in the debate do you have an idea which one it is you mean versus which argument my statement will be no i mean mean which argument might opposition bring up to your opposing team that might directly clash with your argument they can say that you still um, I, I think one of them one of the arguments that they can bring up is why parents um, should get sh should have the right to use their uh, resources then the money they earned to create the best situation for their child so why it's fair if parents use that money to get an advantage for their child and why it's not their sort of responsibility or whatever that all people get a good education. So I think what this argument very clearly needs at the end in the impact is why the government has an obligation to create an equal playing field 
even if that harms the liberties of individual citizens. So why it's okay for government to strive for equality, even if that means that individual rich parents and rich children are harmed because they can no longer go to a private school. I think that's an impact that's very crucial in the argument. Um, so I think that's something I would add, because now you say where you solve inequality, and in debates we always pretend like that's sort of the holy grail, and when you say solving inequality, you automatically win. But to actually win, you need to explain why governments should prioritize solving inequality, even when it comes at the cost of other people being worse off. You get what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I want to say that in the next argument that even if you are a rich uh, parent, you still don't don't like the moment when you spend your money on government school by taxes, but you don't can't use this because it's low quality, and you will prefer use government school if the quality will be equal to private. But that's why you prefer just to spend your money for private. That's the way you could do it, but that still doesn't fully tackle the point because it might be true for some parents, but not for others. So then you still need to make the comparative why solving that inequality is more important than the individual liberty of those parents. Uh, okay. For parents that don't know about problem. Sorry? You mean some parents don't know about how problem is quality of government school? No, no. I mean, let's give you a different example. If you're very rich, you're allowed to buy an alarm system that's very good and then a robber or a burglar will not go into your house but into your neighbor's house because you were richer and you had a better security system that's bad for your neighbor but it's not your problem and you're you're allowed to have a good alarm system the analogy would be everyone should have the same alarm system so the chance that you are robbed is bigger than if you could afford a good alarm system so sort of in line with that we sometimes say in society that people can use their own resources to optimize their, their own life and their own situation if they don't directly harm others. As long as it's just an indirect harm, that's fine. So you need to explain why solving that inequality is such an important uh, duty of the government that it overrides the personal freedom or the personal liberty of those rich parents to choose what kind of school their child attends. Uh, maybe I do that starts from Texas because if uh, it takes taxes from people we should give them the maximum quality that we can provide or we should just can't free government school if the, the school are not good for creating future workers yeah that could be and but it could also be that you just say that uh leveling the playing field is one of the most important uh jobs of a government uh, because people don't choose the situation that they're born in and therefore the reason why we have public schools and public health care is to equal the playing field and to make sure that you are not harmed by the situation that your parents were in and we often override individual liberties to get that done that's why rich people pay way more taxes in order for us to send that money to people who need it more blah 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 so something like that is something that, that would add you to mean the, to so the social government idea it could be but I, we don't have time to go into this in depth uh so i regrettably have to leave it with this for now um because there's one last thing that i want to show to you all before we are done for today and that is as follows uh because last minute we we decided that this workshop would also be about rebuttal and i want to tell you two things about rebuttal one thing is that what rebuttal in essence could be or what refutation could be is just attacking the different steps that we just made in our arguments so one way to see rebuttal is to just um, look at the steps that are made in an argument so um, oh yeah I did, oh here so you have these steps and you could just say why the individual steps are not true. But the second thing, and this is more advanced rebuttal if you want to do that, but I think it's going to help the advanced speakers a lot. If your proposition on the, this house would ban alcohol motion, what you can do during prep 
is think of the assumptions that our position needs to prove to prove this point and then reverse those assumptions so you can use it as rebuttal. So you can just say people will no longer want to buy al alcohol um, uh, there will be no supply. So what you can do when you're in your preparation time, you can think of the argument that the other team is going to bring, then think of the assumptions that they need to prove, and then just reverse those assumptions and come up with mechanisms yourself. Because in that way, you can already come up with rebuttal, even though you don't know what the exact argument is that they're going to run. Because regardless of what they do explain, they always need to explain those assumptions. So if you already come up with three reasons in prep why people will no longer want to buy alcohol it's, when it's illegal and why it's highly unlikely that there will be supply when it's illegal, then that's a great way to get in-depth rebuttal that really kills the point of your opponent. So what I would like you to take away from this workshop is not just that in argumentation you need to think about why, whether something, why something is true and why it's relevant and that you need to use those little steps to get there and that you can use assumptions to do, do so, but also that you can use the same knowledge to improve your rebuttal skills. Because if you identify the assumptions that need to be proven and then turn them around so you can use them in your favor, you can uh, prepare a lot of the rebuttal that you have to bring within prep, which saves you a lot of time. So that's something that I would like to add about rebuttal. So identify which argument the other side is going to run, write down the assumptions that they need to prove in order for those arguments to stand, and then just flip those assumptions and come up with reasons why the assumptions will not be true. That's a great way to, to, to practice coming up with rebuttal. As I always say, time flies uh, when you're having fun or working hard, so we're already almost done. Um, thank you very much for your uh, participation and for all your contributions. Do you have any last questions before we uh, end today's session? Oh, well, where is going to be the recording of that? I don't know. Artem, I think that's a question to you. Artem, are you here? He may have left, but there will be a recording because there is an indication like recording in the... In the top corner. Yes. Yeah, but I don't know where they will put it. I have no clue. Okay, then I will ask him. Yeah, you should ask Artem. He knows, uh, he knows everything. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Good. Artem, you're not here? Uh, I guess Artem like said to me that he will put uh, it somewhere on the page of uh, Saint Petersburg ODC and Zagreb ODC. I guess he told that one on the morning briefing or something like that. So, but I guess Artem will say after that in Discord or somewhere else. Good. Okay, then I think that's it for uh, this session. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I hope it helped. And uh, have fun with the uh, with the practice debate tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. thank bye. you. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Have a good day. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for giving this workshop. I think it was great, and I listened to part of it. And thank, thank you for joining. Thank you very much. And then uh, have fun tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>